thank you, everybody here. Thank you uh, to the Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research for hosting me. Uh, thank you, Donna, for the introduction. And thank all of you for being here. And whenever I, we're going to be talking to people remotely, we're going to look that way because that's where I'm going to do. <laughs> so, so thank you all for being here remotely. Um, I am really looking forward to discussing this paper in context. I've heard that this is a really interdisciplinary group. And so I'm looking forward to feedback from lawyers and non-lawyers on a lot of what I'm talking about. And also, if at any time I just sort of naturally verge too much into legalese, just wave at me and let me know that uh, I need to uh, you know, make this make this accessible to everybody. I'm also just really glad that we can all concentrate on this, that there's you know, nothing distracting. <laughs> So thanks for being here. Um, all right, so my work. I have long been interested in the iterative relationships between law and new technology, uh, both how law can channel the development of new technologies through incentives, through punishments, uh, but also about how new technology pushes and creates legal evolution. Um, it changes social conduct. It changes what kinds of conduct is possible, uh, which in turn creates new uncertainties in the law, uh, enables new kinds of harm, and raises a host of fascinating problems and questions. Uh, a lot of my past work has been on malicious cyber operations and autonomous weapons systems. So code and robots that are actually intended to hurt people. Uh, and issues surrounding that. Uh, in this piece, The Internet of Torts, I am pivoting dramatically to talk about a situation where we have code and robots that unintentionally hurt people. So something entirely new here. All right. Uh, first of all, I want to make sure that we're all going to be on the same page. I'm going to use the acronym IOT a lot in this discussion. That is a shorthand for the Internet of Things, which is a bit of a catch-all term for all of the internet connected devices that are increasingly proliferating in our lives. Um, this includes things like Amazon Echoes and other smart home hubs, uh, Fitbit, if you wear those, um, smartphones, pacemakers, anything that has uh, three traits. One, it's a physical object. Two, it has the capacity to gather data. And three, it has the capacity to communicate with some form of service provider or IoT company or bump a lot of companies together in one. And there, it, IoT devices are revolutionizing all sorts of different industries. So I really just want to focus in on IoT devices that are intended and marketed for individual <coughs> households because I'm really concerned about the relationship, the new kind of, of uh, connection that these devices are creating between consumers and companies. So I'm going to bracket all of the industrial stuff. Um, now, thanks to these physical objects that gather and send data about our lives to companies, uh, companies can provide us with all kinds of tailored and bespoke services, right? So you can ask your speaker to play certain songs, right? You can have a car that has built-in navigation in those kind of systems. You have pill bottles that remind people when it's time to take their pills, uh, refrigerators that can order milk when you run out, innumerable different kinds of convenient services. Um, and all of these traits, well, those are all the different services, but the traits that allow companies to provide those services also allow companies to engage in what I call remote interference, which is the act of remotely altering, alt or act of remotely altering or deactivating an IoT device. Um, okay, so as this is a talk for CACR, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that there's a lot of conversation about the cybersecurity issues for IoT devices. Um, so there's a lot of concern about criminal remote interference, which is really just the idea of hacking IoT devices. Uh, Scott Shackelford has written extensively about this in terms of medical implantables, issues associated with hacking pacemakers, things like that. Um, and what's generally happening here is that in this mad rush to be first to market, with an internet-connected device. Companies that are generally unaccustomed to considering cybersecurity issues are just slapping sensors and wireless connectivity on everything from Barbie dolls to Buddhist prayer beads. Yeah, Buddhist prayer beads. 
Um, if you are interested in a sort of full accounting of uh, all the different, I would say, accessibly connected devices, uh, there's a Twitter feed called Internet to Ship. Uh, I highly recommend it. <laughs> uh, it catalogs advertisements for IoT dog houses, IoT coffee mugs, IoT fidget spinners, <laughs> and a whole host of unmentionables. Uh, so this this market practice has led to this common saying, you may have heard this before, that uh, the S in IoT stands for security. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Um, all right, so even reputable and experienced tech companies are not engaging in great cybersecurity practices with their IoT devices. So, for example, flaws in Apple's uh, smart home system allowed hackers to remotely open front doors, unlock front doors. Uh, thieves are using relay devices to transmit uh, the key fob signals to cars to turn cars on remotely and drive them away. Um, there's a video of this happening actually. Um, and uh, researchers have been able to remotely take control of vehicles on highways while they're being driven and remotely control the vehicle. Speed up, slow down, brake it, drive it wherever they want. Um, now, in some ways, these kinds of hacks of IoT devices, they raise some familiar problems to other kinds of hacks. So we've got the whole gamut, right? We've got privacy and reputational harm. So a data hack versus a hack of your, computer, uh, your uh, security system, your in-house security system, or your baby monitor. Both of these raise privacy issues, right? Uh, you've got economic loss issues. The Sony hack is so expensive both because it compromised data and trade secrets, but also because it actually destroyed a lot of the servers it's using. Um, and you've got a bunch of political and strategic risks. So, you know, the issues of hacking electoral websites are right up there with the issues of hacking uh, voting machines. So there are some common problems here to other kinds of cybersecurity issues. What I want to make the point is, uh, the point I want to make is that uh, what is fundamentally different about IoT devices is their physicality. I mean, their ability to interact with and affect the physical world. And so when they don't operate as expected, it increases the likelihood that there's going to be a risk of physical harm, which is just a fundamentally different kind of problem than a lot of the other cybersecurity issues that we see in other areas. <laughs> so, I've been talking a lot about criminal remote interference, uh, which is really useful in highlighting some of the physical risks, right? The idea of your car being hacked, that's really concerning. Uh, but most of my paper is actually about corporate remote interference, which is when an IoT company or a service provider remotely alters how your device operates. And this is all done legally. Right? This is all something you agreed to when you purchased the device in the terms of the contract. And like everything in technology, there's a good side and a bad side. So corporate remote interference can be hugely beneficial. Um, who here who has a smartphone agrees to a security update on your smartphone at some point? Right? You are all beneficiaries of corporate remote interference. Right? The companies can use this to protect against newly discovered malware, new, new vulnerabilities. Um, they can also use it to reduce industry cost of compliance. So one thing that Scott wrote about his pacemaker paper was about how the FDA required um, an update to pacemakers. Um, they could have done a recall, right, which has been hugely costly, huge, have huge costs, uh, bigly costs, and uh, would have, uh, you know, potentially risk people's health, right, additional surgery. Instead, they were able to push these remote updates to improve the pace of paper. Um, and even companies who even use remote interference to actually save lives. So Tesla had, uh, it was, uh, there was a consumer report on Tesla that the braking distance on its cars were not very good. And so Tesla pushed through this update that improved the braking distance by, I believe, about 19 feet on the car, right? That undoubtedly saves lives in certain situations. Um, and so companies can, can get huge cost savings from the ability to engage in remote corporate interference, and hopefully, right, some of that gets passed along to the consumers. So that's another way in which we all possibly benefit from, from corporate remote interference. 
but and and there's always a but when you spend too long talking about something positive with a new technology. Uh, corporate remote interference also empowers companies at the expense of consumers. And we're familiar with some versions of this, so regardless of how okay you are with it, we're all getting increasingly, increasingly familiar with this idea that there's a privacy trade-off, right? Just, just on this sort of 24-hour trip alone, I think I have signed on to three different free Wi-Fi service providers, right? And I am probably undervaluing my my you know, personal data that is being exchanged in order to get uh, you know, the ability to check my email. I'm probably overvaluing the benefits of checking my email, uh, but I'm making that trade-off, right? We're less familiar with the idea that the convenience that's provided by IoT services comes at the cost of our agency and also potentially our state. Okay, so first I want to talk about surveillance as a vector for control. So I'm intentionally bracketing the privacy harms issues. They're there, they're an important subject, but I'm, I'm interested right here as surveillance as a mechanism for corporate control. Um, I'm going to go through a couple different ways in which IoT devices enable more corporate control over consumers' lives. <clears throat> so first, unlike before, companies can now identify violations of contractual terms in real time. So for example, car companies, most car rental companies have a term in their contract that states you can't drive across state lines. And both the companies and the renters recognize that this is generally unenforceable. It's a useful liability shield for the companies if you get an accident when you're across state lines, but it's, it's there and it wasn't generally enforced. Now with GPS, of course, companies can tell exactly when you crossed state lines and how fast you were driving when you did it. And so this has resulted in situations with one renter who expected a $259 bill uh, was charged $3,400 for a car rental because he drove across state lines and was charged for the terms of the contract a dollar per mile fee for every mile he was across state lines. Uh, there was another person who had a $450 fine for three charges of speeding while using a rented car. Um, that you know, speeding was defined as going over the speed limit, which I'm sure no one in here has ever done or would ever do in a rented car, so you don't have to worry about this. But for anybody who has ever in their life gone over a speed limit, this might be a little you know, worth considering. All right, so in addition to identifying violations as they occur in real time, companies can also enforce consequences for those violations in real time. So starter interrupt devices are devices that are put into lease cars that allow for companies to remote lease your car to completely deactivate it when you've missed a payment. So you're a couple days late on a car payment and the company turns your car off for a moment. There's a power that simply wasn't there before. Um, in a, uh, I'm just going to keep saying in addition. <laughs> there's a lot of in addition here. Um, anytime you have, with any time there's a possibility of enforcement power, there's a possibility of abuse, right? Self-helpers tend to judge their own cause, particularly when the law that these self-helpers are enforcing are the contractual terms that they've written themselves, right? So the relevant law here is the law of the corporation enforced by the corporation. And um, this can result in <coughs> actions, can result even in addictive action. Um, so for example, companies might use remote interference to compel certain actions or to extract concessions that you might not otherwise grant. They can hold your device hostage uh, in a manner that's ram like reminiscent of a ransomware attack, except it's completely illegal, completely permissible under the terms of the contract. Uh, so for example, Sonos, a smart speaker company, recently announced that if customers refuse the changes in the privacy policy that allowed Sonos to do a lot more things with consumer data than it, pri than it previously had agreed to with customers, that it would discontinue all updates to the speakers, rendering them essentially non-functional. And the company spokesman was quite forthright about this. Right? Spokesperson said, the customer can choose to acknowledge the policy or can accept that over time their product might cease to function. That's a big deal. <laughs> like, this is 
your speaker system that you built, that you paid extra for, for the internet capability that you've installed in your house that's now part of your infrastructure. And now it's not going to work because you're not willing to agree to a new contractual term. They, I know we have someone who teaches contracts here. <laughs> that doesn't seem like that they're, they're getting anything in return for this new um, Another example. In April 2017, uh, an individual left a very cranky one-star review on Amazon about his IoT garage door opener. And in response, the annoyed company owner turned off the garage door opener, <laughs> completely bricked the garage door. And you can kind of laugh, right? This is kind of funny and it seems problematic, but so this, a lot of people have garages that connect to their houses. Right. And if your garage door is left open, that invites a risk of burglary, a risk of, of assault, right? It increases the risk of consumer harm. Okay, so finally, uh, surveillance plus the enforcement power is the power to decide when to strategically enforce. Uh, so, for example, the more companies know about you, the more they know when you're going to need a particular item, and that's more of the, the holding it hostage becomes more effective. So if a company had bricked my car just before I had to leave to make it to the airport, I would be more likely to just agree to the new terms and conditions without checking it than I would have at a different time period, right? Um, and so that's, that's an important element. All right, so like a lot of things in tech law, there's some analogies here. We have seen issues of connected products enabling contractually permitted corporate action before and corporate remote control before. Uh, digital tech companies have long employed terms of service and digital rights management technology uh, to create and enforce their own law, and this might result in you not being able to share your music files freely or use a non current coffee pod and a current coffee machine. Um, famously, uh, Amazon deleted a book from a bunch of people's e-readers that, that, that they had purchased. Does anybody know one of the books deleted? 1984. <laughs> of, of all possible texts, Amazon deleted 1984 <laughs> from its users' e-readers uh, without warning. And just because, I mean, or, or it had legal justification, but it, said it could, right, in a way that companies can't go and take a book off your bookshelf. Um, Again, what I think is different here is that corporate remote interference in the IoT context raises the potential for physical harm. And so we've had in the sort of digital context this creation of a legal regime of, of a combination of contract and tort law that operates to shield companies from liability for their actions, things like the leading the ebook, that's being translated over to what's happening with IoT devices. But now we have this risk of physical harm. And that makes this really problematic, right? That people can have an increased risk of property damage and bodily injury that we have, uh, we, but we sign these contracts that let companies do this and simultaneously release them from liability for it. And if you think, as I do, that part of the aim of a civil liability system, our, our, our system of holding people accountable for the harm that they cause, is to reduce the likelihood of accidents by creating consequences for those accidents, then this is hugely problematic, right? Then companies do not have any incentive, maybe some reputational ones, but I'll get there, to reduce the likelihood of accidents caused by remote interference. So just to, to outline the scope of of the potential harms here. I want to delineate different kinds of harms because they raise different kinds of issues. Um, so there are three main kinds of harms associated with uh, remote interference. Uh, the first are direct harms. And the causation here is pretty clear. Um, you imagine a medical implantable. If it's deactivated, the harm is pretty direct and clear to understand. But even engaging in remote updates, can drain the battery, and that can have an you know, a, a life-threatening consequence in the longer term. Even if it increases the need for a surgery to address the drain battery, that could have a life threat. Then there's also second reliance harm. These are situations where you trust an IoT system to work in a certain way, and when it doesn't, you're harmed as a result. So examples here would be your baby monitor 
a senior lifeline uh, fire alarm, a carbon monoxide monitor, a security alarm system, all of these things, they're disabled due to a software update, right? Which I can tell you the terms of services say these might not work due to a software update. Uh, and you're relying on them, that reliance could lead to tragedy. Uh, third is what I call enabling arms. And, and these I find sort of the most complicated and, and most interesting. These are situations where corporate remote interference enables another person. So one example would be that garage door left open, right? Company didn't steal your stuff, right? The company didn't burgle and assault you, but it made it more possible for another entity to do stuff. Uh, let's go back to the starter interrupt devices that are being used to turn off cars. So there have been allegations that cars have been turned off, remotely booted, when people are relying on them to take children to emergency rooms, that people have been left stranded in dangerous neighborhoods. Um, and even one person alleged that her car was turned off while she was idling at a busy intersection. And so if she then gets out of the car trying to escape that intersection, is hit by another <coughs> company says, oh, you know, that, that's not our fault, right? That was the other car that hit her, it was their fault. But you can see that in the individual case, it's going to be really easy to blame the intervening source of harm. But in the aggregate, these kinds of situations happening at scale is going to increase the likelihood of consumer harm in a way that won't translate to the company. And I also, I want to make the point here that in many situations, what's new here is not the actual harm that consumers are experiencing. Um, if you're late on a car payment and your car gets booted, you're not able to take your case to emergency room. Like that, that is the same. Uh, but there's this new vector for it, right? This new possibility for it at scale and an ease in which it can be engaged in. And the other thing that's sort of new here is that this new technology is intersecting with the social and legal regime that's resulting in an increased risk of harm, this increased vector of harm, uh, without a corresponding increase with corporate liability. And that's, that's where I, that's what I find concerning. Okay, so as I was sort of saying before, what happens here is that contract and tort law intersect in a way that ends up shielding companies from liability. Uh, and for the non-JDs, quickly, uh, contract law, I think of that generally as an advance agreement. It does a lot of things, but one thing it does is it's an advance agreement on how to allocate liability when an accident happens, right? So we, we sign a contract agreeing ahead of time that if this doesn't happen as expected or you breach the contract, you will need as much money. And, and it, it determines the cost of harms ahead of time. Uh, whereas tort law is how we assign liability for accidents. You know, classically between strangers, think about automobile accidents, right? There's no opportunity for a contract there ahead of time. So we have tort law that sort of acts as a backstop to assign liability to determine who gets fault in different kinds of ways for the accident. But what's happening here is we have contract uh, that assigns away liability and also blocks tort lawsuits. So the common IoT story is that your terms of service contract, there's a terms of service contract that announces the possibility of corporate remote interference as with or without a breach, right? This can happen if you miss a payment, but it can also happen if you don't miss a payment. They just want to push through an update. Um, and often these contracts limit or completely eliminate company liability for any resulting harm. Uh, a whole bunch of different kinds of terms that do that. And the customer is considered, you know, the customer buys the product. Usually it's assumed that the customer has been notified of this risk, has voluntarily assumed it, uh, and agrees to the terms of the contract. Uh, there's a great South Park episode of that. Um, so it also, so this, this raises a whole lot of different problems and different issues. Um, I want to focus on, on one way in which this blocks some common law tort claims. Um, there are two Tort kinds of tort claims. These are, these are uh, kinds of claims that have come up over and over again. Uh, trying to figure out how to describe all the common law in one second, but, um, but kinds of claims you can bring when someone interferes with your property. One is called trespass to chattel, which means you, people might be familiar with the idea of trespass to land when somebody goes under land without you know, wanting them to, without non consensually. Trespass to chattel is when somebody touches or uses your stuff without you want, without you, be, you, without you consenting to. 
stronger version of that is something called conversion, which is the idea that somebody is using your thing so much that they and, and possibly damaging it that you no longer have use of that item. Anymore. <laughs> and and these are sort of classic tort law claims. Uh, this contract blocks both of these tort law claims because by the contract that's notifying you is room interference, you are consenting to the company interfering with your stuff, right? You're, you're essentially saying, it's just okay if you touch and mess with my stuff. So that non-consensual requirement that's there for trespass to chattels and conversion claims is just not, not there. This is even stronger in cases where you may have even breached the contract in one way or another, say by driving your rental car over the speed limit, or um, if you uh, miss a payment on your lease car. It's not even clear that it's your property anymore, right? The contract might, might sort of imply that this isn't even yours anymore once you've breached the contract. Uh, so people who are, are familiar with tort law are just probably saying, well, what about a negligence claim? Isn't that a good case to address the problem? Uh, negligence claims are, they work um, in certain situations, particularly if the consumer hasn't breached a contract. Um, but uh, let's say a consumer has breached a contract. Let's go back to the car example. Say you miss a payment on your lease car. Then the court is confronted with the question, okay, what was the duty that was breached? What was the company, what, what duty did the company owe this consumer that they, that they then violated? And in the absence of an established duty in the case of IoT remote interference, uh, court is going to cast about for the right analogy. This is a very common thing to see in tech laws. Courts love finding analogies to latch on to to better understand something that looks really confusing. And arguably, this is all in common law methods, building case law. And the court, what's going to be a really tempting analogy for courts are repossession agents. This looks like a digital repossession, right? The problem with this analogy is that repo agents have almost no duty towards the individual to whom they're taking secure, from whom they're taking secure property. They have a very limited duty not to breach the peace, which basically is uh, don't get in a fight, <laughs> don't do anything that could result in getting in a fight. That's just not going to be an issue when you have the possibility of digital remote interference, right? There's not going to be any altercation that comes out of that engagement, um, at least between the, the repo agent and the uh, person who loses their, uh, their car. Um, so it's going to be very tempting for courts to maybe latch on to the wrong analogy. So honestly, just part of my paper is to say, like, let's be careful. And if we're going to use analogies to figure out what the duty is, let's think about other kinds of analogies that might be better than this one. I also think particularly for those enabling harms, those situations where uh, the remote interference enables another source of harm, it's going to be really confusing to establish causation. Right? There's a doctrine in tort law of intervening cause of harm that breaks the causal chain that connects one person's act to the resulting harm, and you don't have a negligence claim if that chain is broken. Um, and there is a it's very easy, and Ryan Kahlo has a piece about how judges do this over and over and over again, uh, for courts and, and for all of us as individuals to blame entities more approximately involved in an accident than the remote decision makers who actually had more power to see avoid the accident. This comes up over and over again in the context of autonomous vehicle accidents. So if you're, if you're interested in autonomous vehicles, you've probably read somewhere that They've been involved in X number of fender vendors. And almost invariably, the following claim is that, but they were all due to the human drivers, right? It was never the autonomous vehicle's fault. And I just wanna, I wanna challenge that a little bit. Um, and, and I owe a great deal of debt to Madeline Elish, who wrote a great paper on what she called the moral crumple zone, challenging this idea. Um, take this example of an autonomous car, or it was actually an autonomous shuttle. It got into an accident one hour after being deployed. And what happened was it, um, <laughs> it was parked, it was, it was driving on the street, a pickup truck was trying to pull out of a driveway. Any human driver seeing the pickup truck trying to pull out of the driveway would have backed up five feet, right? Because that's how human drivers interact. This shuttle wasn't programmed to be able to do that. So the human driver, assuming that the shuttle would back up, backed up into it. Fender bender, 
everybody blamed the human driver. Everyone in the shuttle, uh, the journalists writing about it, I think even the human driver a little bit too. So um, nobody blamed the designers and the programmers that created the system unable to interact with how human drivers interact with each other. And so I think over and over again, you're going to see technology misdirecting responsibility for harm and, and, and shielding remote decision makers uh, and placing blame on the individual involved. Not to say those individuals don't bear some of the responsibility, but I don't think they necessarily always bear all of it. Okay, so if, <laughs> if common law tort doesn't work, uh, another option is something called product liability, which is a different area of law that was meant to address the problems associated with products that were exploding in different ways. Um, the benefits of products liability is that they can't, it's not, those claims can't be barred by contract. You can't contract out products liability. And also, they can be brought by individuals who are not called in privity with the manufacturer. And that means there's no contract, there's no direct link between the individuals who harm and the manufacturer, and they can still bring suit. This is a bit of a revolution in, in tort law. This is a possibility before you had to have some sort of relationship to bring suit. Um, well, and I, obviously the possibility of these third party harms being able to, third parties harmed being able to bring suit is really important um, in the context of IoT devices where you have family members or visitors who might be harmed and, and not, and aren't going to be in contract with the manufacturer. And in some circumstances, product liability claims are going to work. Some of the classic kinds of claims are that the device is poorly designed, that there's a manufacturing defect, or that it had an adequate warning. And in some cases, this is going to be true. I don't think any of these things really work for remote interference. And the reason is that remote interference is a feature. So it's not a bug. It's not something that went wrong. Everything operated exactly as it was designed and intended to. And that's where the harm came from. And so I think product liability claims, without some adjustment of how we think about them, aren't going to work. All right, so if you're interested in going into depth on all these, I highly recommend the paper. Uh, but overall, I'm arguing that uh, corporate remote interference will likely increase consumer property damage and bodily injury, uh, but companies, for a host of reasons, are unlikely to bear much legal responsibility. All right, so this is problem isn't entirely new. If we step back and take a sort of historical perspective on the interaction of new technologies and legal systems, we can see that this is just the latest of a series of situations where new technologies have altered the power dynamics and the social relations between industry and individual. And these are, these moments are opportunities for legal evolution. So for example, uh, in the wake of the Industrial Revolution, courts limited company liability with the mod with, by creating the modern version of negligence. There used to be a bit of a strict liability regime, right? If I did something that resulted in harm, I had to pay the person who I harmed. Then came the Industrial Revolution with its machines, which had this marvelous capacity for mashing human bodies. And this precipitated an accident crisis like the world had never seen before. And if companies were going to be liable for all of the harms they caused, they would never be able to industrialize. This is one version of the story. Um, and so courts, trying to protect these fledgling companies, trying to encourage industrialization, shifted from the strict liability regime to a negligence regime. The idea of the modern negligence, where if you act with due care, right, if you do everything right, and then an accident still happens, you don't bear liability for it. You did everything you could. You did everything that was to, you know, to address all foreseeable harm. And, and so, sort of the historical story goes that this was an action that protected, you know, created this liability shield for corporations and industry and allowed them to industrialize, which was considered a social good at the time, uh, not necessarily for the people whose bodies were being made. Uh, then in the next century, we had the rise of mass manufacturing and cross-country transportation systems. Suddenly, you weren't just buying products from local individuals or, or artisans. You were buying them, that, you know, items that were made across the country. And this precipitated the product liability revolution. I mentioned earlier this, this area of law where manufacturers are being held liable 
and something like a strict liability regime when their products injure people. Um, so this was in some ways a bit of a reaction to the industrial revolution, negligence creation. It increased company liability and, and it created more protections for consumers. And what I'm arguing here is that the IoT is heralding another uh, liability inflection point, another potential transition point in, in tort law. We can continue as we are, right, protecting companies, protecting industries, sometimes at the expense of consumers, um, or we could instead take more action, have some more legal evolution to protect consumers. And I argue this is going to be beneficial for our industry in the longer term. So my proposal is that courts should find that companies have a duty not to engage in remote interference that creates a foreseeable risk of physical harm or property damage. Uh, you could put this another way and say IoT companies have a duty only to engage in remote interference uh, when it is reasonably safe to do so. This could be considered an entirely new duty or it could just be considered a specific articulation of a more general extant duty to take care. I do think it's useful either way to articulate it specifically in the IoT context to avoid some of these problematic analogies I discussed earlier. Um, and this duty could manifest in various ways, and it should manifest in various ways because the kinds of harms, the kinds of risks we're talking about are so different and variable. Um, so it's going to depend in many situations on the facts of the case, the damage potential, the actual damage caused, uh, and the local state law, right? All the different states have different kinds of rules about how to handle tort law. Um, and in my paper, I sort of draw out three potential ways in which tort law could evolve to, to address this problem. Uh, one is uh, courts could create an implied warranty of reasonable interference. Implied warranties are the, they are often created uh, when one entity has superior information, often about a product, and the other entity is vulnerable. And I would say that's certainly the case here. Right, that there should be an implied warranty that companies only engage in remote interference when it's perceived with safety to do so. And it, of course, could create this new duty to <coughs> implied warranty in these products. The problem about implied warranties is that they're really easily contracted around. So companies, in any time companies include express warranties, even if they are lower than the common law implied warranty standard, courts honor the express warranty. They honor what's written down. So you'd have to make this an unusually strong implied warranty to actually be an effective check. Another option is I argue we could have, well, this is a product, right? We've got lots of different kinds of product liability claims that depend on different kinds of relationships. You have one kind of product liability claim against manufacturers. You have another kind of product liability claim against designers. You have another kind of product liability claim against marketers. Saying, well, maybe we need a new kind of product liability claim that recognizes a new relationship between consumers and IoT companies. And so you could have something like an interference defect um, and, and argue that uh, companies can't engage in the same duty, just manifesting in a different area of law. Um, and this could be, well, we could have added requirements like contemporaneous warnings before the company's going to engage in the remote interference. Uh, it's going to be very difficult, right, to have your fire alarm <laughs> notify you, right, that it's going offline for a while. Um, could also add in opportunities for due process. There's actually a Connecticut law that is electronic remote interference and requires companies to give notice and provide the name and phone number of individuals people can talk to about the problem. So that if there's an error, if, if it's unfair, it can be addressed through a human being. So you can imagine some, some requirement like that. Um, I haven't really gotten into the possibility of all of this corporate remote interference being automated, but Sort of let your mind go along those possibilities and, and come up with a black mirror episode. Um, all right, a third possibility is you have something called IoT fiduciary. Uh, fiduci this is the focus, instead of focusing on the product, this is focusing on the nature of the relationship between the company and the consumer and the service that companies are providing to consumers. And courts generally recognize both formal and informal fiduciary relations. Oh, I should, there was. A fiduciary is, is somebody who, engage, who has a position of trust relative to the person that they have sometimes a contractual, sometimes a non-contractual relationship with. So think doctors, right? Doctors have specific duties not to take your data and sell your data uh, to benefit themselves. Uh, lawyers have fiduciary duties. Stockbrokers have fiduciary duties. There's also been a host 
And these are all ones based on the profit. Well, not necessarily doctors. I have to say they're all based on contractual relationships, but you can certainly imagine situations where a doctor is helping somebody, there's no contractual relationship, and they still owe them a fiduciary duty, right? So courts often recognize this, this heightened duty to, um, this heightened fiduciary duty in any relationship that's characterized by power differential, trust, and vulnerability. Right? <laughs> one entity has more power than the other and to, the effect, to affect the other one's life. And I said there's something here that, that could look like a kind of fiduciary-like relationship. That the company might owe users a heightened duty uh, not to manipulate them, right? Not to hold their devices hostage. That would sound more in fiduciary. Okay, so <laughs> admittedly, the solution section to my paper is a little bit unsatisfying, where I'm sort of like, oh, you could do this, or you could do this, or maybe it could happen that way. Uh, and this is, this is not uncommon. Uh, when you're trying to predict how tort law is going to evolve a lot of times, or even how a particular tort law case is going to come out, a lot of times the answer sort of comes down to the facts of the case, and they're somewhat unsatisfying. It depends. There's no checklist, right? There's no one-size-fits-all answer. Um, I want to close by arguing that this is a good thing, particularly in the context of the new technology that we don't fully understand yet. We don't fully understand the capabilities yet, and we don't fully understand the risks yet. I think tort law is particularly useful in these situations. Courts can address problems as they arise on a case-by-case -case basis and calibrate the liability to the device, to the damage potential, to the actual damage suffered, and importantly, to the nature of the relationship between the entities, right? Like, I have a very, very different relationship if I had a smart home hub, which I don't, but I would have a very different relationship with the company that controls my smart home hub than you would with necessarily your fitness, right? These, these two entities know different things about your life and have different ways in which they might hurt you. Um, there's going to be a period of experimentation, uh, hopefully, ideally, our civil liability system uh, will work itself pure, will uh, evolve in a way um, and should evolve in a way that doesn't protect companies at the extent of consumers. I think uh, law, law can evolve here to find a middle path uh, so that we preserve a lot of the benefits, myriad benefits of remote interference uh, while fairly and more efficiently allocating the costs associated with it. And I think you know, this can be done in a way that will benefit both companies and consumers. And thank you all so much. <laughs>
a hang up for a lot of towards law papers, right? But this is certainly the issue of arbitration is not unique to this context. And um, I'm gonna I'm gonna complicate your hypo a little bit more because a lot of times these old contracts for your your dumb washing machine, right? Let's call it. Uh, they they were bundled service product contracts too, right? You got a, you had a warranty attached to it, right? Or you had maybe installation services, and so you got you had a contract that was attached to it that sometimes the stuff was attached to. Now we've got the device, the the, the service, and um, the opportunity for continuing interference, right? Which which complicates it in a different way, uh, but. I'll, I'll, like, that's just <laughs> CC and LV, if you're interested in this, has a great piece about how IoT devices are software bundled with objects, bundled with service contracts, that, that gets at what you're talking about. All of this is not relevant to your actual question, which is what do you do about arbitration clauses, and what do you do for all of these different contractual barriers <coughs> to suit or class actions? Um, that's a real problem. And, and I don't think it scuttles the utility of my argument, uh, because a lot of times companies act in the shadow of tort law, um, and knowing it's potentially out there. Uh, so even just by articulating some of these possibilities, it sort of creates an awareness of this problem that wasn't there before, that I think there's utility to that. Also, legislation can happen in the shadow of these potential tort laws. So I had uh, a really wonderful experience this summer <coughs> to work on some draft legislation that's being prepared in response to the Cambridge Analytica scam, right? And the idea here is let's create a sort of fiduciary relationship for entities, platforms that have so much of our data and we can't control what they do with it. No one's bringing you know, individual tort law suits, but this, this concept of this fiduciary duty is really infusing this draft legislation and, and hopefully going to be introduced soon. <laughs> To address this problem and, and all of those concepts and ideas came out of a couple of, of articles in both the Atlantic and, and law reviews articulating how tort law concepts could be useful for thinking about this kind of problem. So it's not exactly, it's not, it's not the sort of classic common law working self cure system, but it is a way in which thinking through these problems in the context of tort law can still actually have an impact even, even in the shadow of our so thanks. I, I thought your paper was really interesting and certainly really stimulating. As I was listening to it, I um, found myself wanting to play with the title much. Um, and this is the reason. So if you started your talk, you reminded me, of course, about the kind of long tendrils of the corporations that are producing smart items. In a way that made me think that in some ways we're talking about the Internet of Property. Because we're talking about who owns the thing and who has the right to interfere with the thing and for how long. And what is, and so that was the first concept. I was like, well, in some ways we're talking about the internet of property. And then as you think about how long or where the relation, the property relationship extends and doesn't extend, um, a lot of that is set, those terms are set through contract. And so then I was like, it's the internet of contract. Um, and then the numbers catch you, I see Yeah. <laughs> um, I, and so, and I, you know, obviously you talked a, a good bit about contracts and uh, your paper is titled The Internet of Torts and you talked a good bit about torts. But as you were talking about, particularly, um, oh, so, you know, so at some point I started thinking, well, the internet is a common law, which is, of course, an enormous title. Um, and we do appreciate it. <laughs> um, I, but I started thinking about the problem, really, with the common law. And for example, in, in the area of contract, which is where I teach, in the, you know, one of the places that we teach about technological innovation is um, a case called ProCD v. Eisenberg, which was one of the first um, uh, shrink wrap agreements. You know, the software was used to be packaged in shrink wrap and you'd open it and the contract was inside, not outside. And so the that case is taught very much as an offer and acceptance problem. And I noticed that your paper does not really talk about offer and acceptance and the surprise element, right, that is embedded in uh, terms that you really don't expect, particularly with novel 
situation. And that in those situations, at least for a little bit, and I did see that in the section where you're talking about contracts, you talk about unconscionability, and unconscionability may be working for a little while until unsuspecting parties have reason to be suspecting, which is what kind of what happened with the click through browse wrap, click whatever all those shrink wrap. Exactly. It works for a little while until the society seemed to be on notice. So I thought that that might be helpful for a little while because we're still, for example, working through offering acceptance problems in the click through you know, modern version of ProCV. Um, but then I, I, I've noticed that your solutions um, are, for the most part, not common law solutions. They're actually statutory solutions. So when you talked about the implied warranties, for example, um, you know, you've got implied warranties of merchantability, implied warranties of fitness, which would also be useful, and those already exist. So rather than creating a whole new type of implied warranty, you could think about beefing up existing implied warranties that exist mm -hmm. in every state. And not just beefing up the content of them, but also their power. So it's true that in many in many states, but not all states, you can contract out of the implied warranties of merchantability and fitness, but in some states you can't. And so when you look at those contracts, you see that it'll say, like, you know, except in you know, Tennessee, Utah, and Oklahoma, uh, the implied warranty is void. Um, and so you could think about making statutes that are protective that you can't contract around, which is, of course, possible. And then in addition, your fiduciary solution is a statutory solution, not a common law. You can get there through the common law. It'll just take forever. Uh, or you could approach it through statutory solutions. And so I, I just, in, in terms of organize, you know, thinking about the structure of your paper, it might be helpful for the lawyers among us to think about those categories of law, as common law, statutory law, and also the categories within them that um, I think right now your paper doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't do that quite in a way that I think might be really useful for judges and for future uh, writers on 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 this very I mean, really really important topic. So I really thank you for your paper. I thought I think it's, it's excellent and not. Um, you know, I, I hope my suggestions are not seen as a critique because I actually think your paper is really wonderful. Yeah, no, it's not a critique at all. Um, one thing I really liked as I've been getting into this subject and discussing it with people is uh, that, like there's so many different things in here that different people working in different subjects grab onto. Yeah. Uh, right, there is there is an Internet of Property story here. There is an Internet of Contract story, uh, Internet of Privacy and Cybersecurity story. Um, part of it, part of it is, is I ended up in tort law because that's you know there's a little bit of like the hammer looks like a nail kind of a problem, and that that's that's my area um, that I know the best. And and because but I would say I would say not. That all of my solutions are necessarily statutory solutions. Statutory solutions, but they are all contour solutions. Right? All of these things happen in different states at the intersection of contract and tort. And that's what I found really interesting as I was getting into it was that I see the problem as being created by the intersection of contracts and tort, and that a lot of these solutions, with implied warranties, depending on the state, in this state the contract issue, right? In that state the tort issue. Fiduciary relationship sounds differently in contract and in tort, but it, it sounds in both. And and so I was just really interested in this that it, a lot of what's happening here. And then there's this whole property law <laughs> component that I sort of mentally said, okay, I can't I can't go there too unless I write a book on. <laughs> but there's a whole property law that has that there too, um, particularly like the loss of ownership as we increasingly have streaming services, right, and these devices and and. Uh, you know, the, the culture of Airbnb too, and, and Uber. Um, I, I, I'm having a hard time in my mind disaggregating it in the way you suggest, but I certainly open to talking more about how you think it would be useful to fit that in and say, and maybe sign a little bit more and say that right here, this is the contract part of the, are the problems that we do. And also, I'm really, really hoping that people who are interested in this uh, then write those other papers, right? She said, then write, this is actually the Internet of Contract paper, and this is actually the property. So I, I really liked it. And my two comments are, you know, and kind of playing off of what Ian had to say, is that a lot of this is a contract problem, and so I think one of the things that your paper does, it could maybe do slightly more explicitly, 
is add to the literature like Raven's boilerplate about how contract law has gone too far. And this is one example of why. Um, and then my other brief comment is analogy. And so it makes me think of the Gutnick versus Dow Jones decision, which I don't know if you're familiar with the defamation case out of Australia. So an individual in Australia sued Dow Jones about defamation. There was a question about whose law should apply, uh, New Jersey's or Australia's. <laughs> and at the appellate court level, they were using analogies. You know, is the internet a push technology or a pull technology? Is it like putting a newspaper in Australia or is it like putting signals in the air on TV and radio and somebody has to pull them? And then when they got to the Australia Supreme Court, they said, let's just walk away from analogies and talk about policy because this is unique. Let's talk about the harm. And so I think it's really cool how you go through these analogies, but this is just off the top of my head sitting here. Maybe after going through the analogy, you say, you know what, this is an analogy situation. It's its own situation. We should look at the policy. So it's I, not I, a theology. It's not a No, I, 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 I'm fascinated by legal analogies. I have a whole paper on autonomous weapons systems. I say, what is actually the right analogy here? Is it, are these weapons? Should they be regulated as weapons? Are they autonomous <laughs> weapon systems or weapon systems that can independently select and engage targets? And they're in use and display today. Um, are they, should they be regulated under weapons law? Well, that raises the problem because we're not used to weapons having the capacity for independent action. Should they be regulated as combatants? Well, no, because we regulate combatants partially with training, but also partially with a threat of punishment. Can't really punish machines. Okay, well, maybe they're more like child soldiers. Um, in that they're entities that can engage in lethal action and we can't hold them accountable. Well, there's no real good law of child soldiers. We ban them to, to protect children. We're not going to ban autonomous weapon systems to protect the robots. Um, maybe they're animal combatants. Same idea, right? They can act autonomously. They can engage in actions that result in huge problems. Uh, but you can't hold them accountable in a court of law. And that's a great analogy because there's no, there's no law there. And that gets me to exactly what you're talking about, right? This issue of, okay, so then at some point you've got to say all the potential analogies just don't work. And then we need to step back and look at, you know, instead of trying to look through the lens of analogy, which can be immensely helpful for regulating these technologies most of the time, but every so often there's something that just the analogy just doesn't work. And, and we've got to step back and say, okay, how do we, how do we look at this? <laughs> and sometimes it's really hard to do to try and understand something without the lens of analogy. But yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in, in this issue. Do we have any uh, questions from the remote participants? Yeah. Um, sorry, this is uh, Josh Strike from the um, Security Crisis mm -hmm. the IoT House down here. And one of the questions we're fascinated by is the question of the responsibility of a company to a product that they've made, but that they're no longer in production of, but that's still being sold on Amazon or still being used by, especially the children. Uh, we have a great example of this where we got a really bad, dangerous flaw, but the company is like, you know, we don't make those anymore. We're looking towards the future, not the past. The question of fiduciary responsibility for products that still exist, and, you know, and then you have the greater question of fiduciary responsibilities as companies go out of business, and, you know, uh, you don't have to have a bad guy break your garage. If the company goes out of business, they shut down their cloud service. You're not going to, you're going to have a brick garage either way. But so the question of fiduciary responsibility to product life cycle more than through production life cycle or even company life cycle. Rebecca, okay. if you were able to understand the question, maybe I'll ask you to summarize it. For uh, yeah. So I was gonna I was gonna try and please please tell me if I get this if I get this correct that you're concerned about the problem not necessarily of in, intentional or, or automated corporate remote interference. Um, so much as obsolescence, uh, that the, the issue of um, a company stops providing a service in a way that negatively impacts the consumer, um, but the company has either gone out of business or is, has discontinued that product line and so is not providing uh, the updates necessary for its continued functioning. And if I, and you kind of were breaking up a little bit, but if I got you correctly, you were saying you're interested in this from the fiduciary standpoint that that might be the best of the three solutions I offered for this. That yeah. correct some of this. The fiduciary responsibility is for a product, not only with, um, you know, 
supporting it, but actually fixing a dangerous, uh, you know, we have a product in particular that working with the company on that with minor modification, we can stream video out of children's bedrooms without anybody knowing we're doing it, which is uh, really bad. And the company yeah. uh, taking ownership and issuing a simple firmware update to fix the fall we found would seem to be a fiduciary responsibility, whether the product, product is still in production or not. So that, that's the kind of thing I'm thinking about. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'll give an example of, of sort of the problem. Well, you, you mentioned the problem of, of uh, poor cybersecurity, right? Situations where maybe people can break into, can exploit vulnerabilities in, in baby monitors, and the company has discontinued cybersecurity updates to protect against that. Uh, another example that I use in the paper is uh, there was a company that made some benefits called the Revolve, uh, and it was bought by Google. Um, and it's basically, it was a smart home hub kind of device and a networking system for all your in-home uh, IoT devices. And it was bought by Google, and about two years after Google purchased it, it discontinued services for the Revolve. Uh, and an important element of this is that Revolve was sold with a lifetime warranty, right, which, which raises the stakes even more. And so people were obviously quite upset when they ended up with a very, very expensive doorstop, right, that, that didn't do anything anymore. And I, I agree, I think, um, well, I think the fiduciary relationship is really beneficial in the issue of providing continuous cybersecurity uh, for devices, uh, that it's not enough to simply say, we're not, we're not handling that anymore without at least, a fiduciary responsibility wouldn't require the company to continuously provide those services, obviously companies go out of business, but it would require the company to notify consumers and, and to maybe, depending on what promises were made and what the expectations were, uh, to, to provide some sort of, uh, sort of timetable for, for discontinuing services. Microsoft does this for all, all the time, for example. Um, for something like the Revolve, that would also raise the question of like how long, how long is there a duty to upkeep IoT devices? Of course, we don't expect all of our objects to work forever. Right? There's, 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 there are warranties that have different time periods for a reason. Um, and this, this, that part might sound more in sort of the warranty solutions, figuring out how long is it reasonable to expect your IoT device not only to operate as a speaker, but to operate as a smart speaker. And, and that would be a way of addressing that problem. Good. Well, let me ask everybody to join me once again in, in thanking our speaker. Uh, I just want to, usually I would announce at this point who our next speaker is, and I know many of you are expecting me to mention Alex Holderman to talk about voting security. Unfortunately, he's been called to testify to some legislatures, and we're working on rescheduling Alex. So for certain, uh, we will be here back here on November 1st to hear from Wafa Mamili, uh, Vice President and Chief, and Chief Information Security Officer from Eli Lilly, which I know will be a fascinating talk having heard uh, Wafa talk in the past. So. We'll hope to see you then, and thank you all, and thank you from the remote locations for coming today. Thank you.